Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs> Cruising your way next, Off 90. Memories of a legendary Austin teen hangout. The creative place in Plainview. And a 150 year old manufacturing company in Winona. It's all coming up on your next stop, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this trip, Off 90. Some called it Austin's version of American Bandstand. It was known as the Tower, and 50 years ago, it was a teen hotspot. People still talk about it with reverence. The Tower featured a wholesome environment with food, dancing, and live music. Our story remembers the unforgettable. Uh, we'd walk up those stairways on a fall winter day after a football game or a basketball game or whatever was happening. And then all of a sudden, here would be all of our friends and play ping pong or pinball or have a, a Coke and fries. And I, I ended up calling Linda Nibo, one of Clarence's daughters. She told me a story. One night she heard her parents talking. I was laying in bed and the kitchen was right next to the bedroom. In fact, there was a door between the two. My parents were in the kitchen, and I could tell this was a serious discussion. And my dad was telling my mom about this idea he had. He was going to start a youth center in town for a safe place for kids to go. And I could tell my mom was not going with it at all. She was not enthusiastic about the idea. And his wife said, well, Clarence, how are you going to do this? And he says, well, honey, you know that money you've been saving? to build a house, we're gonna use that money. And she said, what? So they ended up going to um, Gar Nash and asked him if he'd kick in and Gar's wife said no. So he went to Dale Modine, another utility. Dale Modine kicked in some money. So the three of the guys from the utilities got you know, all the m machines, the dance floor, and uh, they opened it up on August 31st. 1957. And in October, we moved into a two-bedroom house. So he, he managed to do both things. Where the youth center came from, um, my parents loved to dance. I think that's what brought them together. Uh, they loved music, they loved dancing, and they were good. We'd go down to the chirp, and they would, people would stop and watch them because they were good. They loved music, they loved dancing. So, why not have a place where the kids could dance, have fun, and stay out of trouble? We had kind of three stages in the tower. The first, they began with, they were open all the time. They had hamburgers and malts and um, an occasional band. Uh, and then the middle part, which I was part of, was pretty much jukebox. We just went up there, paid a quarter, and we danced to the jukebox. Then it seemed like they went more and more to bands where they'd have one or two bands every week. The reason we had a lot of garage bands in Austin was because a lot of the kids that were interested in playing music, instead of dancing, they were standing in front of the band. And they would come up and watch the, uh, the bands from Minneapolis play. And then afterwards, I guess Garn Ashwood sit with the bands and they would critique the Minneapolis bands and say, okay, what were they doing and what could you do differently? They were watching the bass guitar player, the lead guitar player, the drummer, whoever, because they wanted to learn those tricks that that guy had that was like, man, I want to do that. I want to learn how to do that. Especially the young bands started, that started up in town because they would see these other bands come um, that he even paid their uh, dues or fees that they had to pay because, again, a lot of them were high school bands. They didn't have the money. Tower, when it opened, did not have a name. And so they had a contest, and um, the 
kids voted and they overwhelmingly uh, chose the tower. And with all the steps to get up there, it was an appropriate name to have for the tower. Because people talk about that all the time, how they would go up steps, hit the landing, go up more steps, finally get to the door. And then once at the door, they'd pay money. But then again, when you were at the door, you would have to, if there was any doubt that you had consumed alcohol, uh, they said Garnash, usually it was Gar that would stick his nose in your face and say blow. And uh, a lot of guys, that was a happy memory for them because they got in or didn't get in. There were 10 rules you had to follow to be a member of the tower. And if you broke any of those rules, you were you know, potentially suspended or you were um, kicked out. And nobody would want to lose the privilege of going to be with your friends. And that was the only place to go. But that was part of the deal. And, and if, you, if you lost that privilege, then you were out. And so when you went to the tower, your parents might have told you something, but I never went up to a girl and said, would you like to dance? What church did you go to? I never asked that one. <laughs> I would just ask, you want to dance? And they said, yes, I go, good. Oh, dancing, dancing. And we're talking about the second floor of a brick building in the summer. So no air conditioning. Uh, they would have uh, big fans in the window blowing in air or blowing it out. I don't know if it worked. And you would dance until you couldn't stand it anymore and then go stand in front of the fans. The, the memory of the towers is so strong that, I mean, one of the things was always was you went to the basketball game, you went to the football game, you went to whatever activity, and then you went to the tower. And you may have stopped at George's before, or after. Once the tower uh, was open, the Pacelli kids came up, the Austin High School kids came up, and they mixed and got to know each other. Clarence did, and Gar and Dale, they unknowingly allowed the, the city to unite. And one thing Dad did was he kept inviting parents up, please come up, you know, see what what it's like up here. And uh, the one parent he got a note from saying that uh, he hadn't let his daughter go and then she, so he thought, well, I should go check it out. So he went up, talked to my dad, looked around, saw what was going on and came back down and said, okay, you can go. And, and that was really important for him that it was a safe place for kids to go. As he was bringing more bands from the cities, um, he started getting gr groups of people following the bands down to the tower. And so he thought, well, this is a private club. And so he said, um, what I'll do is I'll have a dress code that would keep these people from Minneapolis from coming into the club. So basically, he put a description of a dress code, like no grunge clothing or beards. Um, you know, there was dress code for girls. Um, there was no open midriffs. And he published it in the paper. Well, it did not go well with the local kids. Like, you can't tell us we can't, you know, do this. But, you know, in his effort to keep the place safe, it kind of turned around. And then um, it was shortly after that, then he um, sold it. It really became, to all of us, the pass through from 1957 to 1971, it became our stairway to heaven. And on Friday and Saturday nights, they had some of the best bands going. And it just so happens that the first band to play was the Saints. And lo and behold, um, the opening act uh, that happened with the Teller Tribute last year was Barry Rush. And Barry Rush happened to be the, the first act uh, for that. In 2022, it was tribute to, to the Tower Tribute. We're hoping in 2023 that it's back to the Tower. And then in 2024, we want it to be the power of the Tower. 
probably 10,000 youth were um, affected by the tower yes, in some way. No other towns around had a place that they could go to and meet and cross over. It was um, a special place to grow up and the tower was emblematic of that place and time. I think we're worried that people might forget it, that this was a special time, special place, special person, and we don't want it to be forgotten. We want people to still remember it after we're gone. Don't have a place in your home to be creative? Plain View's creative place might be the answer. Whether you need hot glue, yarn, or art classes, the creative place offers a space to do any kind of painting or craft and will help you push your boundaries. The creative place is a DIY art studio for artists and makers and people to be able to come and create. A fantastic place for people to come and connect. Moms, daughters, friends get to come here and create fun art pieces um, that they can create and take for the home and decorate with or give as a gift. And I think it just creates a sense of community. I think people are looking for that these days and you can't have a party without art. It is a place where people can leave their home behind, settle into a space where they can connect with friends, family, new friends, and uh, create something that they don't have to get all the ingredients, all the supplies, and just let go. At the Creative Place, I do offer open studio hours where the studio is just open and you can come in and make and create your own designs, your own project, finish something you've been working on. You can bring in your own stuff, bring in your own supplies. If you need a little extra, I've got it, most likely. They can also be instructed by a, an art teacher, step by step how to do painting and crafting and watercolor and oil painting. We can paint on canvas, on wood. Uh, we can do five foot porch signs here. We can do uh, resin classes, pour painting. Trying a different craft, art, it pushes our boundaries and when you have a space like this, you really get the opportunity to try something different that you don't have to get all the supplies for. We want to create a place where artists can come, um, show their work, sell their work, be profitable in doing what they love. Because I'm, you know, if you're not living your passion in this world, you know, what else is there? And, it, and it, it, it fulfills me too because I get to have my art side, which I gave up for the busy life of having a job and, oh, I don't have enough time to do art or I don't have a space in my house. That's usually a lot of people's reason. Well, here's your space, right? Come to the creative place, be creative. I was doing art on the go for eight years and I loved being able to bring all of my art stuff to a place but it was all getting kind of packed into my storage shed and I couldn't access a lot of things because I didn't have the space to spread it all out. And so here at the Creative Place, I'm able to have those options of, hey, do you need a button? I have a button here. I have hot glue here. I have scissors. I've got yarn. I've got string. I've got paint. I've got, I've got it all here, which is kind of unique in a small town. I hired a, my first artist, Denise Steinberg, and she is now part of my team when she's going out to do art on the go parties. She's the one now that gets to go out and do the traveling art parties so that I can stay here at the Creative Place and I can help spread the love of art even further. So when Nikki decided to have a storefront, it was like, well, how are you still gonna do art on the go and a storefront? Because usually weekends are gonna be your busy time. And I was like, well, you're gonna need some teachers. So we take all the art supplies, um, you provide the tables and the people, and we teach you a painting. It's so cool to see everybody's interpretation of the one thing that we're all kind of trying to replicate. So Diane Gray is one of my makers and she ran and hosted a sugar scrub class 
where we got together and we created our own unique sugar scrubs. I met Nikki through BNI and I actually met her a little over four years ago. And she's like, you're so creative. You really need to share your creative spirit and your energy. She's like, people don't know how to make sugar scrubs. People don't know how to macrame. And what people said when they were thinking about joining, and they're like, I've always wanted to know how to make sugar scrubs. And people are always a little bit curious about essential oils and like how, how much do I use? And, um, and it's so much fun to just teach a little bit how you put one oil together, why you use a little bit less of this one and a little bit more of this oil and how they combine with different uh, sugars or coconut oils or anything that you put together. Yeah, I just, I just want people to like take a chance and experience something that they haven't done before and with some knowledge from an, uh, an experienced artist that can show you how to do it the proper way. I guess my biggest thing is that I love Nikki's passion for helping others. Uh, it was, the creative place was stemmed not for her to benefit from, but for other artists to find a way for them to compensate themselves in with their passion, right? So she supports so many different artists with this space and not just her interests. So. I think that's one of the most valuable things about the creative place. It's about other people. Winona was a lumbering and milling town back when the Watkins Company launched its business. One early product was called Vegetable Anodyne Liniment. Now, 150 years later, the best seller is vanilla. Watkins sells hundreds of products, mostly things that come in small bottles. Let's learn more from the company's historian. The Watkins Company is a very unique company from the standpoint that we have a long history of coming right into people's homes. We've done just about everything there is to make and sell, including car tires and spark plugs at one point. If you want to be successful, it still matters that you have a quality product, you have good customer service, and you're honest and fair. I'm John Goplin. I am the archivist for the Watkins Company. The Watkins Company was founded in 1868, right after the Civil War. We traveled west with the pioneers as they settled uh, the western United States. We have grown with the country as we've gone from a rural population to an urban population. We have seen numerous world wars, great depressions. We've seen uh, technical marvels from the airplanes to landing on the moon. We have, we've made that journey along with, with our countrymen. We have been in the food industry, uh, we trace our roots back to the 1870s, but we really took off uh, in around 1895 when we introduced our world famous uh, vanilla and cinnamon, black pepper, and assorted spices and extracts. Today we have approximately 200 to 300 different products that we manufacture. Uh, but the company is probably best known for our vanilla, cinnamon, and pepper. Vanilla has been our number one seller since the 1940s and has remained our, our number one seller since then. We offer a wide variety of vanillas. We have our number one seller, the baking vanilla, which is a, a fairly unique formula. You don't usually see that in grocery stores outside the Watkins brand. It's formulated to be double strength or double force, which means it won't bake out or freeze out. We still offer a pure vanilla, uh, which is best suited for uh, whipped creams, ice cream puddings, mousses, that sort of thing. We offer an imitation vanilla that's clear in order for people to bake white cakes and white frostings. 
We offer a vanilla powder, which is unique here in the United States, a vanilla bean paste, and a no alcohol uh, version of vanilla for those who may have gluten issues. We also follow trends. Um, as everybody knows, uh, things come in and out of favor. Recently, for example, we have launched a, a, a series of bitters, on uh, orange bitters and aromatic bitters, uh, as, that, uh, as the popularity of mixed drinks has, has come back. Today on the Express Line, we are running our organic pure orange extract. The process is that the, the bottles are loaded onto the line, they are, go through a filler and are filled up, there's a labeler, a cartoner, and at the end of the line, they will be put into shippers, palletized, and then will be shipped out across the country. J.R. Watkins uh, was born in 1840 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He moved with his family to Minnesota in 1862, and initially he planned to be a farmer. Uh, when those plans did not work out, he decided to become a businessman, and, and that's when he founded his company. When J.R. Uh, started in 1868, he was not a very wealthy man. He lived in a pretty humble five, six room house out on the prairie. Uh, but over the decades of hard work, he grew his business, and by the early 1900s, he was a multimillionaire, uh, very wealthy, and as his company grew, he wanted people to know uh, how successful he was. And part of that uh, was building what he considered the finest private office building in the world. By the 1890s, we were covering most of the lower 48 states, uh, and then we were making our way into Canada by that point. By 1910, we had manufacturing facilities in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, Winona, and Winnipeg, Canada. At one point, we had large um, manufacturing facilities also in Newark, New Jersey, uh, light manufacturing in, in California. And as the company continued to grow, we expanded overseas. In the 1930s, we expanded into Australia, uh, later into South Africa. We were in Great Britain and Sweden. We were in Britain until the Germans bombed our facility. And so by the 1940s and 50s, we were an international company. We were not just in the United States, but we were also in Australia, South Africa, and, and other regions. The Watkins Company at one point or another has made just about everything from animal feed to remedies, food products, chicken feed, um, all sorts of products. And then we had a lot of premium items too. We would, you know, could be a uh, candy dish, it could be a mop. Uh, we've sold cleaning supplies. Uh, so we've done just about everything there is to make and sell, including car tires and spark plugs at one point. The reason that we have survived when most of our competitors have disappeared is the fact that we continue to focus on the quality and um, customer service. We have a long history of coming right into people's homes and that is one of the reasons that we are still here today and still so well known is that a lot of people grew up with the Watkins salesperson coming to their door. The Watkins man or woman uh, brought a lot of neighborhood information because they stopped at all the local homes and could uh, keep people updated what was going on in their neighbors in the age before uh, cell phones and texting and, and all of that. Bill Porter uh, was a salesman for Watkins for over 50 years, born with cerebral palsy and was unable to find uh, traditional work. Bill was such a remarkable person that in 2002, they made a movie about his life called Door to Door. Good morning. My name is Bill Porter, and I would like to take a moment of your time to tell you about some of the many fine Watkins products available. 
And, of course, they all come with a 100% money-back guarantee. I don't think so. Who is it? It's a very uplifting movie about the triumph of the human spirit, about someone who overcame the hardships of life to be very successful. In today's world, we don't necessarily knock on your door and come in in a physical sense, but we still come into your home through uh, the internet, through online sales. Uh, we, we still do uh, direct marketing. Uh, we have social media. We are reaching millions and millions of more people than we did, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Today, um, you know, we were able to compete with, with a number of brands because we are now in retail stores. You'll find our products in companies such as Menards or Walmart, uh, your local grocery store. We do sometimes have opportunities to partner with other international companies, but the main focus of the Watkins Company is North America. We've reached the end of this tour. Thanks for riding along. See you next time. Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.